Today, we're going to focus down on chapter six of my new book, The Quest for New Knowledge. And this um, uh, chapter is entitled Cytokine Immunotherapy. It really um, all evolved and, and, and took place in the decade between 1985 and 1995, 94, 95. And it, it, it's really about what, what else was going on in the world of immunology and interleukin-2 and, and that kind of science that was independent of what we were doing in the laboratory at Dartmouth. At Dartmouth, we were really we were what they, you know, what the what the restaurant people call. We were in the weeds. It was like we were we were so busy and we were so focused on, on the trees that we didn't. The forest was beyond, way beyond us at that stage of the game. But but I was I was aware of all these things that were happening. I couldn't help but be because I'd go to meetings and I'd also and, and people would call me up and on the phone and say, Hey, Kendall, did you see this? paper that came out in science or whatever, and I'd say, yeah, and so I'd have to go read it and find out what was going on. Uh, and that was one of the good things about the grapevine, because the grapevine, you, you didn't have to be really worried that something really important was going to happen in the world, in your world, that you didn't know about and you'd missed, because people would tell you, particularly if they thought that it would bother you. you know, they'd say, hey, Kendall. So this is about cytokine immunotherapy. And by by the mid 80s you know if you remember back you know we, we first purified the il2 molecule the homogeneity so that it was actually pure in 1983 and so and then soon thereafter the gene or the cdna for for il2 was cloned and that was critical because it allowed the genetic engineering to produce huge quantities of il2 and and then you could purify it using our antibodies or you could also purified biochemically so that the pharmaceutical companies got into this big time right away and um, they soon be able to, they soon were able to produce you know as much il2 as you want and put it in little bottles and so forth and uh, immediately uh, investigators started thinking about using it in the clinic and in particular steve rosenberg who i mentioned in our prologue he was he was just chomping at the bit to get it into his cancer patients so he could tell everybody that he was curing cancer down at them down at the nih and um at the nci and you know he back in about the time that we were just purifying il2 he he started to use crude condition medium lymphocyte stimulated condition medium that had il2 activity but also had all a bunch of other things in there including calf serum and all these things to allow the cells to grow. And he started using that in a clinic and stripping it into cancer patients and not much really happened. The good news was is that he didn't make anybody sicker than they already were. You know, and, and in cancer, clinical cancer um, therapy, as, as an investigator, you can do a lot of things that you wouldn't do to somebody with rheumatoid arthritis or hepatitis or something like that because because the, you're dealing with people that have a lethal disease and um rosenberg in particular took advantage of that I and mean, he did things down at the nih the nci in the 80s and the 90s and beyond that really wouldn't you couldn't do that sort of thing that he did on the scale that he did it in the numbers of volunteer subjects who who were desperate because they had cancer and they were going to die. So that's just as a preface to this whole thing. So everything was going along all right. We were working on the IL-2 IL and IL-2 receptor and we were focused down on these things. And in 1985, there was, uh, Rosenberg gave a press conference and ended up on the six o'clock news uh, with Tom Brokaw and all the rest of them and Walter Cronkite and whoever else was <laughs> were the talking heads at the time as this tremendous breakthrough in cancer therapy. What he, the story that he told that it was later, that was later published in the New England Journal, which is probably the most prestigious clinical journal in the world. He had 25 patients with various kinds of cancers, mostly solid tumors, no, no leukemias or anything like that. And, and he had been giving them high doses of IL-2 intravenously in an IV, what we call an IV push, every eight hours. And he'd bring them into the hospital and start giving them the IL-2 every eight hours. And what would happen to these people over, he would do this for, for five days, so Monday through Friday. And what would happen to them, they'd be okay for on Monday, but on Tuesday, they started to get really sick with high fevers and shaking chills and so forth. And then by Wednesday, their, their blood pressure would start to drop. And what Rosenberg would do then was, is it, because he was a surgeon, and he would then try to fill up their, their blood vessels with IV fluid. And over the course of that five-day time, 
and, and this is what he reported in, in his um, paper was is that there was a, an average of about a 10% gain in weight of these individuals. So that if you were 150 pounds, you gained 15 pounds in five days. And that was all fluid. And the fluid that he put in to try to raise the blood pressure because the blood pressure had dropped basically didn't stay in the blood vessels. It just it diffused out of the capillaries, the small blood vessels into the tissues. And in, so that the people would become edematous. And they also, there, there's a lot of fluid that went into the lungs. And so they get short of breath and so forth and so on. Well, it turns out that it, with this kind of therapy, the only given for five days, and he didn't repeat this very, a couple, some patients he repeated it, he waited until they <laughs> recovered, and then he, and he did it again. But most patients only got one five-day course. And then over the course of weeks and months thereafter, uh, what he reported in, in his press release was is that if almost 50% of these patients, half of them, of these 25 patients uh, underwent a, a, a marked reduction in the size of their tumors. And a lot of these tumors were visible or they were visible on x-rays or CAT scans, CT scans, and so forth. And they could measure the fact that they'd shrunk them down over this time period. So that was, that was really, you know, breathtaking. I mean, there wasn't too many other things that could make those tumors shrink down like that because they were in cancers like colon cancer and malignant melanoma and renal cell, kidney cell carcinoma that were really refractory to, to, to other kinds of cancer therapies, particularly chemotherapy and radio, radiotherapy. Thing is, is that only, well, 50% of the people got a nice response, but 100% of the people got the toxicity. Now, as I said, when I started, you, you know, when you're dealing with a lethal disease, you, you can tolerate toxicity for a week or two, if you're going to live, this is a good thing. Now, the question is, wh why did he use the doses that he used? He used very, very high doses, um, milligrams of IL-2. And he had done, he had published previously um, pharmacological studies when giving IL-2 and then measuring the plasma concentration of IL-2 over time. What, that's what we call pharmacokinetics. And we had published in 1981 our, our IL-2 uh, receptor um, data. And so we knew, and what he had shown in his pharmacokinetics, that you didn't really need to give huge doses of IL-2. You could get, to get concentrations that should have saturated the IL-2 receptor and, and should have been effective if you were trying to treat the T cells, the immune system, not trying to kill the tumor with IL-2. Because would, why would IL-2 kill the tumor? But he basically ignored his pharmacokinetic stuff and he ignored our receptor papers. And he just pushed ahead and he kept increasing the dose and increasing the dose and increasing the dose in preliminary studies before he got to these 25. And he found that with very, very high doses and when everybody got really sick, that he would get these, some of these responses. And I thought at the time, I said to myself, well, this is crazy. You shouldn't do that. I said, you know, I said to myself, well, it's a hormone, stupid. You don't... <laughs> You don't, it's not chemotherapy. With chemotherapy, that's, that's perfectly logical because the more you give, the more you kill you get. And then what the name of the game there is to try to arrive at a dose that's, you know, it's going to be toxic, but you're hoping that you kill most of the tumor cells before you kill a lot of the normal cells uh, in, in the body. That's, that's how you do it. So more is always better. And that's, those are the principles that he was using, the principles of chemo, toxic chemotherapy. The other thing was is that you have to realize that, that um, Rosenberg was a surgeon. He was educated by a, a fellow by the name of Francis Moore, who was the chairman of surgery at the Peter Bed Brigham Hospital in, in Boston. And Fran, they called him Franny. Franny Moore was notorious for uh, pushing uh, trans, transplants, kidney transplants, at a time when we had no idea what was going on in terms of graft rejection and that sort of thing. And he, he pushed things um, at the Brigham uh, beyond uh, the nurses and the young doctors, and the residents and so forth. They, after a while, they refused to do what he wanted them to do. But, then, but he was the mentor of Rosenberg. Mm -hmm. And you know, surgeons are doers. They would they prefer action to inaction, and uh, and that's all coming out of that whole heritage and so forth. Um, whereas scientists are thinkers, and they they prefer very carefully controlled experiments where the variables are are reduced to, to one or two, so that you can do an experiment and find out an answer, is it yes or no kind of thing. So Rosenberg was a surgeon, and he was a doer, and he just kept 
pushing ahead, essentially. Now, to give you a little background on this, I think I talked about the, the <clears throat> International Congress of Immunology that occurred five years previously in 1980 in Paris. And of course, since I had trained with Maté in Paris in the, in the uh, early 70s, Paris is sort of like my second home. You know, I, once you live in a place, and then you go back to it. It's sort of, oh, you know, I remember that, and I remember that, and so, and so you, you feel at home again. And so on the day before the, the meeting was supposed to begin, there was a garden party given by the Congress at the Jardin de Luxembourg, and that's which is in the sixth arrondissement. And um, I knew it well, because that's what, we used to go there all the time. I'd take my little toddler kids, they were only three and four, because they had a big a fountain uh, in, in the, on the grounds of the, of the um, chateau that was there. And the kids, we, we got them uh, model sailboats and they would sail their little boats in the, in the fountain. And Lynn and I would sit at one of those little kiosks on the side and have a glass of wine and this, this was good. So anyway, we were on this, the meeting, um, the day before the meeting, Sunday afternoon, they had a garden party at the Jardin de Luxembourg. And I found, and, and it was really interesting because the grounds are meticulously kept at the Jardin. And it, there's signs all over the place that you can't walk on the grass. And yet here at this garden party, everybody was it, was, it was really crowded. I mean, you had to be on the grass. And so everybody was, you know, and all these people from all over the world were laying on top of the grass and drinking champagne or whatever. And I found myself um, sitting next to this young woman who was named, ultimately, her, she was Elizabeth Grimm, who I knew. And so we chatted and, and exchanged pleasantries, exchanged pleasantries. And she was a, um, a postdoc with Rosenberg at that time and kept continued thereafter. And we really didn't get into what she was doing in Rosenberg's lab. We didn't talk science, but we, you know, but it wasn't until this thing had happened in 1985 that I found out what she was doing in that lab. And what she was doing is she was working on, a, on cells to administer to the cancer patients along with the high doses of IL-2. And, these, and the reason she was working on that was because what, what Rosenberg was trying, wanted to, to be able to do would be to generate cytotoxic T cells. Remember, that's what, where I started back in, uh, in the mid 70s, early to mid 70s. I was working in the mouse generating cytotoxic T cells that could kill leukemia cells. Well, that's what Rosenberg wanted to do too. He tried to generate those, but he couldn't really demonstrate that these that he could get cells to be cytotoxic if he cultured them for a few days in IL-2. And that's what Elizabeth Grimm was doing. So they cultured the cells for three or four days. And they, they said that then after the three or four days of culture, that the, 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 it was a whole, all of, the, all of the, the mononuclear cells from the blood. So that contained T cells, B cells, natural killer cells, and monocytes, <coughs> mac macrophages. If you did this and then, and then in vitro, they could demonstrate that these, these cells would kill the patient's tumor cells. And so they used that as justification to strip those cells back in, into, the, into the patients at the same time that they used these high doses of IL-2. So they, they couldn't really, Liz Grimm published a couple of three papers around 1984, 1985, saying that these cells were T cells that were the ones that were the killers. And I said to myself, well, that's strange. Because I knew T cells, most of the T cells, by all of our, our IL-2 receptor tests, did not have <clears throat> IL-2 receptors unless and until they were activated by their specific antigen, and then they would gain IL-2 receptors. And then if you gave them IL-2, they would proliferate. So I thought that was a little bit off the wall. But I, you know, I wasn't there in their laboratory doing the, their experiments. And so, you know, I was on the outside looking in. So it was at this time, Rosenberg then started talking all over the place, you know, after his press release, which is a little bit, you know, for a scientist to give a press release to, to announce a new finding to the scientific community. That was, you just didn't do that. Later on, Gallo did that for HIV, but you didn't do that. That was not considered um, kosher. And Rosenberg said that the toxicity that all these patients were getting, 100% of the patients got the toxicity. The toxicity was the therapy. If you didn't have high fevers and shaking chills and a drop in blood pressure and so forth, your tumor wasn't going to go away. That also seemed very strange to me. A year later, after that 
the 1985 episode episodes, there was another investigator on the West Coast, Louis Lanier, who was a natural killer cell expert or guru. You know, he'd been working in the end case field for a decade. The thing is, is that if you take a whole, if you take blood from somebody and extract or purify the so-called peripheral blood mononuclear cells, which contain T cells and B cells and NK cells and monocyte macrophages, only about 10 or 15% of the cells are NK cells. And Louis Lanier was able to show by fractionating this, all the cells and testing them for cytotoxicity after um, IL-2 was given to the cells in, in the test tube, that it was the NK cells, it wasn't the T cells. It was the natural killer cells that were killing that could kill the tumor cells after they got a little sniff of vial too. So I thought that was, you know, I could, I could understand that. Uh, uh, I didn't know how it was working and we hadn't really studied ourselves, natural killer cells for IL-2 receptors and that sort of thing. Uh, but I was, I, I thought it was much more understandable than, than the fact that T cells were going to be doing all this business. So another thing about Rosenberg, before I move on, you know, science is a team sport these days. And I think I may have mentioned this before in, in some of the other videos, but I mean, the gone, long gone are the days when you have the nerdy old little scientist working in his closet, single room all by himself and sh shifting the test tubes around and so forth. I mean, you you got to have a team to do all this stuff. And, they, and different members of the team have different expertises. And so everybody works together. And, um, and so when, when you find something that's important is what Rosenberg was talking about. You publish it in, in a journal. And so they published their, their stuff in, in the New England Journal of Medicine. And Rosenberg was the first author. And I thought to myself, well, that's strange. I mean, the, the leader of the lab is, is called the senior author. And, and the, 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 the rigor is, is that the senior author goes at the end. And the first author is, is usually a younger person, a postdoc or a sister professor or something who's, who's really directed the project, the, the, you know, the, the nitty gritty done the work, whereas the leader of the lab, Rosenberg in this instance, would be off in his office on the telephone all the time, and, um, and so forth. So I thought, oh, that's a little bit strange, where Rosenberg's the first author on this. But there's a string of papers that came out in between 1985 and 1995, where almost all of them, Rosenberg was the first author. And the thing is, again, that's not the way we do it in this business. Well, it wasn't too long. Then in 1987, there was another paper in the New England Journal from Rosenberg's lab. And again, he was the first author. And now, uh, not only just 25 subjects that he reported on, he reported on 106 subjects. He gave them both high doses of IL-2, same recipe, every eight hours IV, and the, the so-called lymphokine activated killer cells I, forgot, I may have forgotten to say that that's what he called them because he couldn't say that they were T cells and he didn't, he didn't really want to say that they were NK cells. So he, he invented a new name for them. These were LAC cells, lymphokine activated killer cells. So he gave them this therapy and of 106 individuals, now the response rate that he said was close to 50% with only 25. Now it's, now it's down to, it's cut in half. It's now about 25% of the patients got a, a really good response. And again, 100% of the patients of the subjects got severe toxicity. And so I said to myself, well, if everybody gets the toxicity and the toxicity is the therapy, as Rosenberg has said, why didn't they all have a good, fantastic response? Seems strange. Then, but he, Rosenberg kept on pushing, and this is the stage that if he had been at a university with an institutional review board that really overlooked what he was doing, he never could have kept on going with all this toxicity. I don't know what they were doing at the NIH, but they didn't have an, uh, an IRB, an institutional review board like, like we had at Dartmouth uh, and, and so forth. Anyway, by 1989, two years later, um, he published again, 652 patients, subjects, um, and he had the same, basically the same response, kind of about 25% of the patients got a, a very good response. 
Um, but only half of them, about 12%, 10 to 12%, were they a, a, a complete, re, what we call a, a complete response or a complete disappearance of the tumor. So that was 1989, that's 600 patients by this time. And finally, there was a lot of, there was a lot of questions as to whether or not you needed to do the lax cells, the lymphokine activated killer cells, and the high doses of IL-2, or one was better than the other, and so forth. So finally, they published a paper in 1993 where they had done a randomized controlled trial comparing IL-2 alone with IL-2 plus lax cells. And what they found was is that they had very similar results. And that was the end of the lax cells. Um, so they stopped using the lax cells after that. So, um, so that was it by about 1993 or so. And the, the thing that happened around the same time period was is that there were two other cytokines that people were, um, uh, uh, that had been identified in the late 60s and, and 70s that uh, were very interesting to the tumor people, to the cancer people. And, and one of them um, was called lymphotoxin. And that was discovered by two different groups, Nancy Ruddles uh, from Yale and Gail Granger from, uh, uh, from UC Riverside. That <clears throat> when this cytokine, this, you know, it's all again from crude supernatants and so forth, put onto tumor cells would kill tumor cells in the test tube. They could show that with the various killing assays. That was 1968. Then in 1975, another group of investigators at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York, led by a fellow by the name of Lloyd Old, um, came upon a, what, they, what they felt was a macrophage product. The other people had called it lymphotoxin because they thought it was coming from lymphocytes. But now they found this, this, um, this uh, cytokine coming from macrophages that when they put it onto tumor cells, in, when they used it to treat uh, animals with visible tumors that had been inoculated into them, the tumors would shrink within 24 hours. It was pretty dramatic. They called their, their factor tumor necrosis factor. And so it was first shown to be toxic for uh, tumor cells um, in vivo, in the, in the animal. At the same time, they did experiments in, in the test tube and showed that this, um, this same preparation would be cytotoxic for the tumor cells in vitro. So these two cytokines that were um, uh, discovered or identified in the, in, the early, or in the late 60s and early 70s, in mid 70s, um, by the 80s, by 85 or so, the molecules responsible for the activities had been uh, identified and purified and the genes had been cloned for these things so that you could get your hands on large quantities of them and large enough to start to think about using them in the clinic. And because they had been characterized as being toxic for tumor cells, the idea was, that, say, in contrast to the IL-2 therapy, where, you, where the idea was you're treating, you're trying to boost the immune response, here, they, they felt that these, these things would actually be just like chemotherapy, except not, um, that would kill the tumor cells directly. And um, there were several groups. So once, it, once they became available, then, you know, it was cacophony because all the clinical cancer investigators wanted to be the first to use this stuff in the clinic. One, one was a fellow by the name of Jordan Gutterman, who was, who was down at the MD Anderson um, Cancer Hospital. And I had met him a, a decade earlier when I had been with um, Maté in France. Because when I was there with Maté, uh, Maté was sort of at the height of his celebrity. And all the young uh, investigators, cancer investigators, were coming through his operation and giving seminars and, and so forth. And Jordan Gutterman came through and he gave it one of those lunchtime déjeuner um, seminars and, and so forth. And then afterwards, 
we all retired to uh, Mate's office for un cafe and um, chatted about things and so forth and so on. And, you know, I, I was invited, which was good, and for me anyway. And after Gutterman left, Mate looked at me and he said, I don't, I don't trust anything that guy says. <laughs> so that was very, I was very impressionable at that stage. So I was quite surprised at that whole business. But so Gutterman published a paper in 1988 uh, and basically showing he gave one shot of TNF to um, cancer patients and as sort of a dose finding safety study and nothing happened bad uh, and he reported that. But then another group from Roswell Park Memorial Institute in Buffalo um, uh, had given also one shot, but they, they gave it as a intravenous infusion over an hour. And they found that when they gave it this way and the doses they were using, the blood pressure fell. And then at the same time, uh, another group at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, they gave a 24 hour infusion, intravenous infusion, and when they got to certain doses, the blood pressure dropped. So that sort of cooled, cooled the heels of a lot of people at that point in time, because they, could, they realized that if they, they, this stuff was pretty toxic, <laughs> tumor necrosis factor. Um, and right about this time, between say 1985, 86 and 89, 90, there were another group of investigators uh, at the at the Rockefeller in, in, uh, University in New York City, which is right across the street from Cornell, where I ended up eventually, and right across the street from Memorial Sloan Kettering, where they had discovered TNF, they were working on a uh, on on a serum factor that they found in, in animals that were infected with parasites and different kinds of things, and. They found that if they if they um, purified this stuff and stuck it into other animals, that chronically over time, that the animals would lose weight and become uh, wasted. They become cachectic, very much like cancer patients are. If they when they're dealing with it, with their cancer over a long time period, so this was a chronic phenomenon. But there was, a, uh, there was an investigator by the name of Tony Cerami, and he was the one that was interested in this whole thing. And he, the reason he was interested in this was because he'd gone to, when he was a younger guy, he'd gone to um, Africa, and he found uh, he was really um, uh, interested in patients that were suffering from parasitic diseases over there because they would become wasted. He came back and he started doing experiments, and ultimately, had focused down on not using uh, microbes to cause this syndrome to happen, but rather he used lipopolysaccharide, LPS, uh, which is the cell wall um, lipo, uh, lipoprotein that is um, on a lot of the different kinds of bacteria. And of course, we've, I've gone through a little, little bit of this before. If you inject LPS into mice or rats, you get what you get is what the, is a syndrome that's called septic shock, where the blood pressure falls. Now that's interesting, you know. The TNF causes the blood pressure to fall. So, one of um, Tony's postdocs by the name of Bruce Boitler had joined his lab, and Tony was very, very much a biochemist. Um, and so they started to purify whatever this stuff was that was trying to cause this. And ultimately, Bruce did a series of experiments that were really well done and very, very good. And he ultimately showed that this stuff that they called cachectin um, was the same thing as TNF. And he, they did that by comparing amino acid sequences from TNF, uh, you know, gained by other people and then their cachectin molecule. And one of the very first experiments they did was what we had already done with IL-2, and that was is that radio labeled the, the, the cachectin. Uh, 
and they found it, that it bound to all kinds of, of different cells from normal um, tissues, essentially. Because prior to that time, the tumor necrosis factor was sort of taken literally. They thought it was a factor that would kill tumor cells, and it wouldn't do anything to normal cells. Nobody knew why it caused the blood pressure to drop. But it turns out that there were receptors for TNF all over the body, all kinds of cells. And that immediately took it out of the realm of being an anti, simply an anti-cancer agent. Because now it, it looked like it was gonna fit into the, what, what we had been talking about it up in Hanover at Dartmouth, was just that this is a hormone. It, it regulates bodily functions, essentially. Um, and one of the things that was found soon thereafter, uh, it would, the, it, people showed that TNF would cause the blood capillaries, the very tiny little blood vessels that are all over our body, to start to leak. And of course, if that happens in a local situation, when you have an inflammatory reaction because you got a little cut on your skin and it gets red, hot, swollen, and sore, well, the swelling is due to the fact that the plasma is leaking from the capillaries into the, into the site of inflammation. And that, and that works really well for the host defense because that means then the, the antibodies and, all, and the cells that are in the blood can get out of the blood vessels and into the tissues and start to fight off whatever the problem is. But if that happens all over the body, if all the capillaries start to leak and they all start to leak at the same time, you have a drop in blood pressure. So that's a little bit of a problem. And so that was really a revelation and that, that, was, that sort of stopped the, the cancer investigators from trying to use TNF in the clinic, TNF or lymphotoxin uh, in the clinic to try to kill tumor cells. So, but how does that connect? How does that connect to IL-2 therapy that Rosenberg had used when he got the same kind of the syndrome, the sort of septic or toxic shock syndrome of high fever, chills, and, and um, drop in blood pressure and so forth? Well, it turns out that um, Tony Cerami got together with Charles Dinarello. Uh, up in Boston. And they did experiments where they injected LPS into humans in a very controlled situation. And they then, and they measured then in the serum after the injection of LPS, they could, they could see a peak of TNF and interleukin-1 and interleukin-6. All those pro-inflammatory cytokines were, appeared in the plasma. And then the blood pressure dropped. So LPS causes septic shock, and um, LPS has is, is not, not been known to be a major macrophage stimulant. So the idea was that LPS was activating the macrophages to make these pro-inflammatory cytokines, which then causes cause the septic shock syndrome. Well, there was a young fellow um, by the name of Michael Palladino, who came from, who, um, had been a graduate student with Jeanette Thorbecker at NYU back in the 70s. And then he left NYU and went to Memorial Sloan Kettering and was a postdoc with Lloyd Old, who had discovered TNF. So, and he, and so Palladino was, was at Sloan Kettering right at the time that they had, you know, got into heavy into the TNF story and so forth. So he knew all kinds of things about TNF. And then he was hired, um, to become a, a young scientist with, uh, with a company, a biotech company, actually the very first biotech company, which is called Genentech, which is in South San Francisco in a big warehouse. Um, uh, very incongruous kind of thing. That's where it started. Now it's a multi-bajillion dollar business. Um, and when Michael got out there, the, 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 the molecular, this company had been started by the gene cloners, the molecular biologists. And, and they were looking for something to develop as, as a new drug and that sort of thing. And Palladino said, well, you ought to work on these, 
cytokines. You got to work on TNF and lymphotoxin and so forth and so on. Um, and and uh, and they did. And ultimately, they they purified lymphotoxin and TNF, sequenced them and ch- uh, cloned the genes for them. So they were the people who who made them available for uh, clinical kinds of studies. And Palladino got together with the people at UCSF who were using, high, using the Rosenberg recipe for IL-2 administration. High doses given every eight hours, IV push. And, and he studied then the plasma concentrations of TNF and lymphotoxin and interferon after the, after the administration of interleukin-2. And he saw the same thing that Dinarello and Cerami had seen with LPS inoculation. So somehow, LPS is stimulating macrophages. IL-2 is supposed to be stimulating, we, we guess, I, by this time, NK cells. So NK cells are known to be big um, producers of interferon, interferon gamma. We knew that beforehand. And it was just about this time that that still didn't, you know, we still didn't understand what was going on. It was just about this time in the late 80s and early 90s that I, I was contacted by a friend of, of Ellis Reinhardt's from the Dana-Farber Cancer Center in, um, in Boston. And it turns out, and his name was, this fellow's name was Jerry Ritz. And I knew him through Ellis. And actually I'd had him up to Dartmouth and we'd had, um, Big conferences in, in we, had, we had a big memorable conference in Cafe La Fresse where I had people up and so forth. And Jerry said, you know, I, I'm thinking about, I'd like, I'd like to, I'm losing patience. He, Jerry was a bone marrow transplant person. So if you remember back with Georges Maté, who was the first one to give, or, or to try bone marrow transplantation to treat leukemia cells. Well, Jerry was one of the Mate progeny, because, because here he is, um, uh, let me see, that was you know, 20, 30 years later. He's, he's one of the guys that that field had matured so that they were using bone marrow transplantation to treat leukemias and other kinds of um, hematological diseases. And so what they would do is, is they take the patients and they would first wipe out the, the bone marrow with high doses of chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And then when they would replace that bone marrow with bone marrow from, uh, from um, third party donors, uh, or they could, they could um, use what they call autologous bone marrow, which is another story. And then it would take a few weeks for the, for the new bone marrow to regenerate the whole hematopoietic system, all the red blood cells and the white blood cells and the immune system, the lymphocytes uh, and the monocytes and the macrophages, the T cells and the B cells, all those things. So that process would take a couple of three weeks. And what would happen during that time was the people would be basically in the, in, in the ICU in a bubble because they had no host defenses and they were very susceptible to infections viral infections particularly, which the lymphocytes are good at uh, combating. So Jerry said, you know, Kendall, I'm losing a lot of my patients, my bone marrow transplants um, to these infections. And so I'd like to see if I could give IL-2 early on. So we give the, we put the bone marrow cells in, and then maybe if we give them IL-2, we can, you know, accelerate this rejuvenation process so we won't they won't die of infection in, in that two or three or four week time period and he said so i what do you think and i said well it's interesting and he said well how would you do that and i said well i, I i'm not so sure but i know what i wouldn't do and he said what's that and he said and i said i wouldn't give it the way rosenberg's been given it where these high doses that are really really toxic in and of themselves will kill everybody so um, he said, okay. Um, and so I thought what we should do is we should, um, we, we already had at that stage, we had all of Doreen's experiments where we knew that the, if you used, if the effects of IL-2, at least as measured by the proliferation of T-cells, uh, 
were dependent on only three variables, dependent on the IL-2 concentration, the IL-2 receptor density, and the duration that these two, that these molecules had to interact with one another. So I sort of felt intuitively, and, and I thought for a long time that Rosenberg was just crazy to do the, what he was doing. That if you're going to be, if you're going to, if it's a hormonal system and you want to, you want to, what you should do is saturate the IL, just enough IL-2 to saturate all the, the receptors and then give it for a long time. Because the longer you give it, the, would be the longer you can keep the stimulation of the, um, of the immune system going. So I said, well, you know, we would just, at that stage, if you think back to chapter five, we just discovered in 1987, the second chain of the IL-2 receptor, the beta chain. And so I thought to myself, well, we, if we're gonna do anything in the clinic, we better, we better relook at, at the expression of both the alpha chain and the beta chain uh, of IL-2 receptors on just normal peripheral blood T cells, or all the cells, NK cells, T cells, and so forth. So Jerry thought that was a good idea. And so we, he, he um, identified one of his postdocs, but who was, whose name was Michael Caligiuri. And I identified one of my postdocs, uh, or grad students actually, and that was um, Antonina Zemoidzinas. She had, was a grad student at, at um, Dartmouth who'd come from Lithuania. And her, her nickname was Nina, Nina. So Nina was fingered by me and Mike Caligiuri was fingered by Jerry. Nina and I drove down to Boston again, and we spent some time with Jerry and Mike, and we planned a series of experiments. And then you know, we're, we would do part of them, and they would do part of them, and so forth. And what we found was, when we looked at the, at the peripheral blood um, lymphocytes and so forth, was is that the, the killer cells that were identified by having a molecule called CD8 didn't have any detectable IL-2 uh, receptors, and that and we that's sort of what we'd found before, so that wasn't surprising. The helper cells, T cells, which were identified by having a marker of, of CD4, um, about five percent of them had detectable alpha chains on their cell surface, but not not we couldn't really see the beta chain on those cells. Then if we looked at the NK cells, this is where we hit pay dirt because at least 50% of the NK cells, natural killer cells, had the beta chain, clearly detectable by flow cytometry, no question. Ha, however, only about 2% of those NK cells also had the alpha chain. Now you need, we knew at that stage from, uh, all of our experiments, Wei Mei Wang's experiments, looking at the receptors on the on the different cells and so forth, that if you had both an alpha and a beta, you would have a high affinity receptor. And if you only had cells, if the cells only had beta chain, they would have about a tenfold lower affinity receptor. There's like hundredfold. I can't remember now. Anyway. <laughs> um, and that meant that if we used low doses of IL-2, we could activate that 2% of NK cells. Um, and then we might not have any of, of all the horrible toxicities that Rosenberg had, had uh, created. And it also meant that Rosenberg's high doses of IL-2, the reason that, one of the obvious reasons that they could have been toxic was because they were activating all these other NK cells that only had the beta chain. Because as soon as you raise the concentration of IL-2 high enough, now you're saturating receptors on those, um, on those natural killer cells. And natural killer cells, you know, they kill. And they also, that's why they're called LAK cells, LAC cells, lymphokine-activated killer cells. But um, in addition, they make other cytokines. They make pro-inflammatory cytokines. And one of the major ones that they make is interferon gamma. Now, by this time, uh, in the you know late late in 1980s, everybody knew that interferon gamma activated macrophages to make TNF and IL-1 and IL-6 and all of these cytokines that by now had been incriminated into the toxic shock syndrome. So that was so. 
So we said to ourselves, well, that explains it all as far as we were concerned. So we, we started then do, to do experiments, clinical experiments in humans, in Jerry's, Jerry identified not his bone marrow transplant patients right away, but just cancer patients in a very general sense. And we did a series of, of, of phase one dose finding safety studies. And we wanted to find out whether or not we could give interleukin-2 for an extended period, you know, the duration of the IL-2 receptor interaction. So Jerry uh, devised this, this system whereby they put indwelling catheters in the, into the arms of these patients, and then you would attach that, that line to um, a little pack or a, a chemotherapy pump where you could pump in 24-7 uh, whatever you wanted. And they would use this for chemotherapy, uh, delivery, and so forth intravenously. So we did that, and we uh, were very careful and working up, we, you give four subjects at a time, a dose that you thought was really low and wouldn't cause any problems, and then you double that and you go up four more patients and so forth and so on. So we arrived at the dose range where we could safely give IL-2 without any toxic symptoms, and so we, we uh, and that was between five micrograms and 60 micrograms, 50, 50 micrograms. And by comparison, so a microgram is, is, um, is 10 to the minus six grams, and a milligram is 10 to the minus three grams, a thousand fold more. Rosenberg's doses was 70 milligrams a day. And that was, I mean, I'm, yeah. 70 milligrams a day. I'm gonna to have to go back and check my numbers now. Anyway, it was huge by comparison. So we established the maximum um, non-toxic dose of IL-2 that we could give for three months. And during that time, then we kept periodically uh, measuring uh, different things, immunological assays in the, in the blood and the plasma of, of these patients. And we found that uh, over the course of three months, the natural killer cell concentration in the peripheral blood changed from 15% of the, of the peripheral blood cells to 75%. So there was a, an enrichment of the natural killer cells over this time period. Uh, the monocytes also went up a little bit. Um, and the, the, interestingly, this, the helper T cells doubled and then just maintained its, their concentration over that time period. So we published that. Um, and we published that actually in 1991. We thought we were you know, go, doing pretty well and I was happy about that. And, and um, this established the, what I call the rational interleukin-2 immunotherapy uh, protocol, as opposed to irrational which was, Rose, which was Rosenberg's approach to life. I purposely chose that uh, rational versus irrational. Then the next thing that happened was also sort of interesting. In 1992, the next year, five years after we had discovered, uh, we and others had discovered the beta chain of the IL-2 receptor, a Japanese investigator by the name of Kazuo, Kazuo Sugimura published that he'd found a third chain of the IL-2 receptor, which became called the gamma chain. He not only uh, showed it at the protein level, but he cloned the gene for it, the cDNA. Uh, and, uh, and that was interesting because at the time that they were doing all these experiments, my son, Carrington David Smith, was, was in Cosmo's lab uh, doing experiments over a year in Japan. I, I, you know, I enticed him to take a year off from college so this is his third, like his third year abroad, because uh, then I didn't, we didn't have to pay for uh, his college tuition. And, <laughs> and, uh, and it was a great experience for him because, you know, you're coming from little Hanover, New Hampshire with only 5,000 residents and you're going to, the, Cosmo was, was in Sendai, Japan, and that was, that's where the, ultimately the tsunami happened. And, um, and, and they kept it a secret from Kerry. He didn't know they were working on the IL-2 receptor. They had him working on a, 
on a RNA tumor virus. And I'm sure they were using words. He got to be almost bilingual in Japanese and he could write the, giant, the Japanese characters and so forth. And he'd be on the subway, you know, going various places in the city. And there'd be people right next to him hanging on straps and so forth. And he could hear them talking about them. And <laughs> he could understand what they were saying. So anyway, uh, Coswell, um, you know, found the third chain of the receptor. And the third chain of the receptor was very important because it was found to be also involved in the receptor subsequently of several other five, four or five, six other cytokines. And so they ultimately called it the common gamma chain. And it was rapidly thereafter found that, if, uh, that a very severe immunodeficiency syndrome in, in children and in babies called the X-linked severe combined immunodeficiency syndrome X, X skibs in the acronym, was caused by a mutation in the gamma chain receptor, which really solidified the whole biological importance of, of cytokines and IL-2 hormones and receptors and the whole deal in, in, uh, in immunology. And subsequently, what's happened since then, in the last 20 years, in, in many of the molecules that are uh, either cytokines, the receptors, the molecules in, involved in the signaling pathways inside the cell and, and so forth have been, uh, been found and have mutations in them and, and, and be responsible for a lot of the immunodeficiencies, not all, uh, that people have been suffering from for years and years and years. So, so that was good, but we had, I had decided after you know, when we, when we identified the beta chain and then two other groups almost simultaneously also found the beta chain, I said to myself, you know, this is getting, there's too, too many people in this, um, too many <laughs> competitors. So I, just, I knew there was probably a beta or a gamma chain, but I elected not to do it because we were involved in other things and so forth and so on. But that still didn't really put the nail in the coffin as to what was going on with Rosenberg's high-dose IL-2 therapy and the natural killer cells and the whole thing. And it turns out in 1994, a new cytokine was discovered that was numbered, this is up to IL-15 now. And IL-15 was interesting to the IL-2 people because of the fact that its receptor ultimately was found to have a different alpha chain than the IL-2 receptor. But it, also, but it used the beta chain and the gamma chain from the IL-2 receptor. And IL-2 would bind to the beta gamma chain um, if you raise the concentration high enough. And then uh, it was found that most of the NK cells, their receptor that, that we thought was just the beta chain was really the beta gamma chain and it had the and and they had the IL-15 alpha chain, but it didn't have the IL-2 alpha chain. But if you gave them IL-2 and gave them high enough concentrations, then you could sh stimulate those guys, and they'd make interferon gamma, which then would activate the macrophages, and they would make TNF and lymphotoxin and IL-1 and IL-6, and cause shock. And that was that's that decade solidified the whole story really wrapped it up in a big tight bow and i'll stop there so if you've enjoyed this video um please like subscribe and sign up for my newsletter uh, where i'm serializing my new book which is called the, the quest for new knowledge you'll find a sign up link below hey thanks again it's been great